Hello there, and welcome back. I'm Martin, and today on Daddy Rule to One, we're going to be talking about the history of the Bard class in Dungeons & Dragons. This is part of my video series on the history of early tabletop role-playing games, including D&D. And we have already talked a little bit about where the Bard came from originally in my video on the secret origins of D&D classes. So there's a link to that video up here, but we're going to be going more in depth in this particular video. We're going to talk about um, where the class first debuted for D&D and then how it's kind of changed over time through the various different editions. I'm also going to touch a little bit on something that honestly I, I find a little bit um, odd is, um, you know, I just see memes all the time, especially lately, of this assumption that all bards are sort of um, lascivious. I'll use that word to be polite. But this idea that um, I, I've seen memes say, like, if, if you're not playing a bard that way, if you're not playing like this overly um amorous type of bard like are you even playing a bard and i'm kind of i i just don't know where that really came from so i've dug into it a little bit and i'm going to talk about that and then at the end of the video uh before i get to the bonus content i'm going to share a uh, just a fun story about um, a bard character in one of the games that i've played in before it was actually not played by me it was played by a friend but it was just a kind of a fun way that i thought to play a bard all right so to jump in uh, let's just do a quick, um, re, you know, uh, going back to talking about how we talked about in the secret origins of D&D classes, just a quick reminder. So the Bard class for D&D was not part of the original game in um, 1974 when the game debuted. The th there were three classes, fighting man or fighter, cleric and magic user. The thief was added about a year later in the Greyhawk supplement. Bards did not debut until the strategic review. Uh, volume two, number one, which was also the sixth issue of the magazine. So as a reminder, the strategic review was the publication that TSR uh, put out before the dragon. OK, so um, and I talked about that a little bit last uh, in my last video that I did on the history of Dragon magazine. So you can see that here if you want to learn more about the strategic review. But the Bard class debuted in strategic review. Now, unfortunately, I do not have any issues of strategic review. However, many of the articles were reproduced or not many, but, you know, some of the, the key ones were reproduced in um, the Best of Dragon volume one and uh, including the original Bard class. So this is where I first read it was in this magazine. Uh, Best of Dragon, and this is Statistics uh, Regarding Classes, Editions, Bards. And this is by a gentleman named Doug Schwegman. Now, I've done some research, and I can't actually find that Doug wrote anything else that was published for D&D um, or other role-playing games. It's possible that he did, but he's, you know, he's not in like the role-playing game database and things like that of, like, you know, authors and creators. So, uh, but in any event, this is the class that Doug created and he said he got his idea here where um, he's inspired by basically Nordic skulls, Celtic bards, and European minstrels. Now, originally European minstrels, that term was used to refer to any kind of entertainer. So that could have been acrobats or jugglers or, um, you know, fools kind of thing. Uh, it was only later that it kind of became attached solely to kind of like, you know, musician, singer types. OK, so but he's taking um, inspiration from all of those to create this type of character. And this would have been for original D&D. Remember when this uh, came out, this is February of 1976 is when the strategic review number six was published. Advanced D&D wasn't published yet. So he talks about it being a jack of all trades class. So a, an amateur thief and magic user, as well as a good fighter. OK, and then it goes through and, and there's really no... Um, there's no, uh, you know, ability score requirements for this particular class, but they are able to be um, played by elves, dwarves, or halflings. Okay, and then um, of course, and then humans, right? So this class was open to every race in um, original D and D. And then it goes through and just talks about, you know, some of the different abilities and stuff. You see here the level titles: Rhymer, Lyris, Sonneteer, Scald. Um, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, that one that starts with an R there, but you have jongleurs, troubadours, minstrels, muse, lore masters, etc. And then the different colleges that they're part of, their magic user spell ability, their charm percent, their lore percent, and then of course their experience points, their D6 hit die that they have. And it just goes on to, again, explain everything about the bard uh, class. And then uh, there's an article here on barding harps, so magical... Uh, harps that you could have. So that's the original class, 1976. Now, D&D, 
uh, is kind of splits into two different games. We've talked about that many times uh, here on the channel before. So, you know, make sure to check out those videos on the history of D&D editions just to kind of catch up on that. But Advanced D&D comes out in 1977. And that's sort of when the game splits into two different areas. You had the Holmes Basic set that was really trying to um, you know, sort of codify and make simpler the rules from original D&D, but it only goes through third level and it directs you to advanced D&D. It's that kind of in-between version. But advanced D&D comes out in 1977 with the Monster Manual and then the Player's Handbook in 1978. Okay, now bards are in this book. However, they are not in the list of main classes here up in the front. They're all the way at the back here in the appendix. And they're put back here because Gary says that basically they're very powerful and they're a very different type of class. And so it's um, it's supplemental and some DMs might not want to allow them. But in this particular case, th they're very difficult to qualify for. You had to have a 15 or better in four different abilities, strength, wisdom, dexterity, and charisma. And then you had to have at least a 12 in intelligence and a measly 10 in <laughs> constitution. So very difficult to, to qualify for. And we did talk about this before. They can only be human or half elven. But this is the first, what we would call, if you're familiar with third edition terms, the first sort of prestige class, okay? So um, in this particular case, this is not like the bard that you saw um, in here in the strategic review, even though Gary does pick up a lot of ideas from it. And he does thank in the... Um, it, like there's a thank you to some of the uh, people that helped with the game in the front here. And Doug Schwegman's name is listed um, as like special thanks. So it's clear that Gary was using that class and then adapting it for his own needs. But in this particular case, um, the Bard starts out as a fighter. And at some point after fifth level and before eighth, they have to switch to the, a thief. OK, and they have to become a thief. And then at that time, sometime between fifth and ninth level, they then leave off thieving and they begin clerical studies as druids. In this particular game, druids were a subclass of cleric. That's why he says clerical studies. But when they switch to druid at that time, they are now bards. So you've gone through at least five levels of fighter and at least five levels of thief. And then you get to become a bard. And do you see your level titles here, which pretty much are picking up exactly what was in that article that we saw before. Now, Gary switches the magic user spells to druid spells. Part of the reason druid spells weren't, weren't used in here, it just wasn't the design of the class, but also druids as a class didn't exist when the bard class was created for this magazine. So um, there, you know, he wouldn't have had cause to use those because those spells didn't exist yet. Okay. But then he goes on, uh, you know, and to describe the bards, but this is the first edition bard. They're very tough because they're essentially already 10th level characters minimum by the time you start playing one as a first level bard. So, um, very different. It's the only class in, uh, original or I'm sorry, in advanced D and D that is like that, that requires you to play as other classes before you become the class that you want. All right. So it's, you see here the armor, leather or magical chainmail only. They can't use shields. They have limited a list of weapons here. So um, uh, interestingly, like there's basically no two handed weapons and that's because they were expected to be carrying a musical instrument. So no bows or things like that. They can use oil and they can never use poison. Uh, except by neutral evil bards. So that's another part of this bard class is that as far as um, the alignment, they had to be some form of neutral. So neutral, lawful neutral, chaotic neutral, neutral good, or neutral evil. So that's it. Okay, and then uh, it goes on a little bit more and talks about the different abilities here. But again, while this is sort of that um, it, it's based on this original bard. So it's it's really thinking them more of like these kind of warrior types. You're, I mean, again, you're starting as a fighter. So you have all those fighter hit points and attack values. And then you're switching to the thieves. So you're picking up thief skills and then you're becoming a bard. But um, nothing in here is necessarily about them being, like I said, overly amorous or lascivious. So, um, uh, you know, but they've got their, they do have their charm percentage. So I guess you can read into that if you want. All right. So that is one of the abilities that's been with the bards kind of pretty much from the very beginning is this ability to cast charm person spell when they're playing their music. So if you want to kind of take the charm person spell into sort of like a dark area, which I can see why people do that. Yeah, I, I get that. And I can see how that could, I guess, 
be misinterpreted as being that all bards are going to be, you know, overly like that. And then I've also seen people say, you know, this game was created in the 70s. Um, rock music were, you know, they, they were like the gods of, of, of that era, um, these rock idols. And you've got bands like Kiss and, you know, um, Black Sabbath and things like that were very, or, you know, even going back to like The Doors and Jim Morrison, you've got these very, very, um, uh, you know, attractive and charismatic leaders of bands who were known to be, you know, pretty, um, uh, you know, experienced with the with with the opposite sex or, or even, you know, with same sex. It just depends on the person. Right. But um, so maybe it comes from that, this idea that the bards are the rock stars of the D&D world. I don't really subscribe to that. I, I tend to look at them more as like that Nordic Skald type. So Nordic Skalds were um, the, the they were people that were um, composers of what's called skaldic poetry. There's two different kinds of Norse poetry. There's skaldic and there's Attic. And the skaldic poets were really composing songs and odes to um, like the kings and things like that. So they had a very important role. And then you have the Celtic bard. Um, and they were a very, very important part of society as far as like being teachers and genealogists and, and um, you know, composing the histories of their of their particular groups of people. And so that has nothing to do with going out and like, you know, trying to perform to try to seduce somebody, right? It's just, that's not what this class was originally intended to do. You can play it that way if you want. It just wasn't intended that way. Okay, so that's 1978 Player's Handbook. All right, so let's jump ahead just a couple of years. This is Dragon Magazine number 56. And this is from, I believe, 1981. Um, it'll tell us here in a second, I believe. Well, in any event, I think it's from 81. It might be from 82. Uh, just, oh, December of 81. And right here on page five, we have this article called Singing a New Tune, A Different Bard Not Quite So Hard. And this is by a gentleman named Jeff, I'm going to say Goals. Goals. And uh, so Jeff wrote a few things for Dragon Magazine, a um, couple of monsters, really, that that's kind of it. Um, in particular, there was a funny one um, where they did. It was one of the April Fool's issues, I believe, that every April Dragon used to do like these kind of goofy, funny issues. And in one of those, I think it was maybe issue number 60, there's a list of like these kind of goofy monsters. And one of them um, was the Beaver, And the picture um, looks like the character from Leave It to Beaver, the TV show. So that was the Where Beaver, and um, uh, Jeff Goltz created that one. But anyway, in this particular case, he is creating a, a new bard class. So he's basically saying that the the bard class, as it is, is just it's too hard to qualify for, and it takes too long. He writes this little funny intro where there's these two half orcs um, that are NPCs or whatever. And, and, uh, the DM is talking to them about whether they like bards or not as if they're like real people. And they're kind of saying like, they're very, they're nasty. They hurt us because they're so strong. Okay. So, uh, but then he goes around and he modifies the class in here to make it so that you can play it from first level. So going back to that original idea that Doug Schweigman had had, which is just, it's a standard class, right? Uh, he swaps out the druidic spells, um, and he, he adds in a little bit of um, illusionist spells, if I remember correctly in here. And then um, he kind of uh, gets rid of some of the thief stuff. And then he talks about why he does that. So he's choosing the Welsh version of the bard and the bardic heritage of the Welsh people. And he talks about specifically reading it in the... Um, I looked this up earlier and now I just forgot how to pronounce it. Um, Mabinogian. I know I just butchered that. I apologize. I had looked it up to, to be prepared for this, and I've forgotten the pronunciation. Um, but anyway, uh, famous Welsh stories and uh, the Bard character from there. So uh, it goes in and talks, and he, he gets really into this idea of like, you know, the Welsh, the Welsh prototype for this class or the Welsh in inspiration is kind of how he built this particular class. So uh, he changes the level titles, as you'll see here. Um, some of them are the same, but he changes them, keeps the same hit points. Of course, the experience points uh, tables change. They do have the charm, they have the lore, and they have read languages now. And uh, he talks about different arms and armor here. So they can wear leather armor. They can use shields, but only when they're um, not trying to charm because they have to use a stringed instrument 
when they're trying to charm. So very specific here. That's gone away in other editions of the game. Uh, the types of weapons that they can use, can't use poison, blah, 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 right? Uh, the alignment in this one, he changes it quite a bit. So in here, he's saying you can be lawful, good, lawful, neutral, pure, neutral, neutral, good, or chaotic, neutral, or chaotic, good. Basically, they can't be evil. And he's saying that's because evil people are against beauty in any event. And so um, because the bard is all about creating these beautiful songs, um, then you can't be evil. All right. So there's a little bit in here on saving throws and spell use and languages. And then uh, they do have druid spells that I misspoke earlier. Um, but they also get some illusionist spells. And their spell list is a little bit um, different because there's specific spells that they can't use. And it tells you which ones those are. All right. Some fun art here. And then it's a pretty long article, actually. And so and then it goes into their lore ability, which is, you know, again, part of the bard class from the very beginning. Charms and suggestions. Um, in this particular case, they're talking about, you know, animal uh, creatures of at least animal level intelligence. And so that's in there because the idea is like, you know, you could do like a pipe piper, right? So, um, you know, to, to pipe all the rats out of out of the city or like whatever. That's kind of where that that animal level intelligence is coming from, all right? So that's all in there. And then they have other effects of particular bard songs that you can have. Uh, what do you do if you have opposing bards playing songs? So that's that. And then uh, this article is kind of uh, this not article. This whole section is all about bards. So here's sage advice. This was the question answer section of Drag Magazine. Remember pre-internet, um, the way to understand how to do things. Like if you didn't know, you couldn't go online and look it up. Well, you wrote to Drag Magazine and said, "I don't understand this rule. How does it work?" And then you know, hopefully they picked up your question and put it in here. So these questions are all about bards. So this person wants to know. Uh, if a paladin or ranger can become a bard. So it might sound like a strange question, but the idea is like in advanced D&D, &D, ranger and paladin were subclasses of fighter. And since the class said you start as a fighter and then move to a thief, this person's asking, well, do the fighter subclasses count? And the answer is no, they don't. And then they're also asking if a, if a neutral evil um, bard could be an assassin instead of a thief. And again, the answer was no. So um, then they talk all, you know, you have to have a, two whole paragraphs to explain why that's the case. And then when they start as fighters, why are they limited in the armor they can wear? Or are they limited in the armor they can wear? No. But then it tells you like, you better find a suit of magical chain mail to stow away so that when you become a bard, finally you have that ready to go. But you can wear plate mail while you're a fighter. But once you switch to a thief and then become a bard, you can no longer wear that. Very clunky, cumbersome way that that class was put together. Uh, and then, you know, they can work magical chain mail, bastard swords. They can they employ them when using their thieving abilities without penalty because bards could do that. And they're saying like, yes, they can because, um, you know, they have attained proficiency in those abilities. Um, they're limited to the use of certain weapons. And then uh, it talks about the like what level they have to be. There, it's just a really interesting article. <laughs> so um, that's all in here. And then there's this whole article here on songs instead of spells. And this is by Bill Howe. Now, Bill wrote a few articles for Dragon Magazine as well. And also um, worked on, I want if I remember correctly, I think he wrote some um, adventures for the Living Greyhawk campaign. Uh, I'm pretty sure he also created the Ring of the Necromancer magic item for Dragon Magazine. But this particular article is about how, um, uh, like, bardic magic isn't really spells, they're songs. And so that's how they should be depicted um, in the class. And, like, it would change what kind of spells they actually have access to. And so he rewrites what spells he thinks should be available for bards. Now, of course, all of this stuff in here in Dragon Magazine like this new version of the Bard. So this is unofficial because Gary didn't write it. So in Dragon Magazine, unless Gary wrote it, if anybody else created it, it wasn't considered official. And they would specifically tell you like, oh, it's not play tested properly or it's not balanced or like whatever. So use it at your own risk. Like usually what they would tell you with a new class, like this version of the Bard, they would tell you to use this for NPCs only, not for PCs because Gary knew the correct way to create a class that was balanced you know that's what they would explain it and so um so the only three classes that ever appeared in dragon magazine that became official at this period of time um were 
the um, Barbarian in issue 63, the Thief Acrobat in 69, and then the Cavalier in number 72. Now, there were classes that debuted earlier in Strategic Review, Illusionist, Rangers, and Bards. I did talk about those before. Those were written by other people, but they didn't come official until Gary wrote them in the Player's Handbook. Okay, so that's issue number 56 of Dragon Magazine. Now, issue number 60 of Dragon Magazine was uh, was th that April Fool's issue or one of them I was talking about earlier. And in that issue, um, uh, Roger Moore, who was uh, one of the editors, he eventually becomes an editor at Dragon Magazine. And so he creates a class called the Jester, and it was very specifically described as an NPC class. We'll get into that later. I have a whole series going uh, I just started it, but it's on the History of Dragon magazine. And so when I get to that particular issue, I'll go into that a little bit more. But just just alerting you that like people are kind of like looking into this class and sort of figuring out how, you know, different modifications. So a gesture is very related to the idea of a um, of a bard. And even so much so that in issue number 103 of Dragon magazine, so this is getting up into like the, the mid 80s, um, Gary Gygax writes an article in which he says that he's working on a jester subclass for the bard class that will be part of his version of second edition advanced Dungeons and Dragons, sort of like a revision to the game. So unfortunately, um, we will never know what that class looked like. Uh, at least I don't think we'll ever know. I don't know how far Gary got on writing that, if he ever even started, or if it was just an idea that he was writing in that particular column. But uh, Gary was uh, eventually parts ways with TSR. It's a whole thing of why that happened. Again, I'm not going to get into that because it just takes too long. But um, Gary leaves TSR. And so he doesn't write second edition Dungeons and Dragons. That's written by Dave Cook. And so the gesture subclass of bards is not in here. And in fact, this kind of changes the game. It was still compatible with first edition, but there's quite a few changes. So this comes out in 1989 is when this is released, this uh, second edition. And in this particular version of the game, you have bards now as a core class, what we would now refer to as a core class. We didn't use that term back then, but um, it eventually becomes standard to think of things as core. So here in the way they divide these up is that you had four four kind of like big groups. You had warrior, you had um, mages, you had um, priests, and then you had rogues. And those were like the four groups. And then all the classes fell within them. So within the rogue kind of like overarching class, and the experience points are the same for any kind of rogue that you would play. You had thieves and you had bards, and you can see that right here. So the advantage of the bard in this is that they're using the most, the, the quickest experience point um, chart here. So the rogues and, uh, I'm sorry, thieves and bards all qualify for second level at just 1,250 experience points. That's faster than anybody else in the game by a pretty big margin. Okay, so um, so this describes thieves, but then you get over here and it describes bards. Now, this is a new thing because now we're seeing an official version of the class where bard is, again, part of that core part of the class. But let's look here in this blue part. They talk about how it's inspired by, you know, um, bards from Ireland, Wales and Scotland. OK, and then they give you historical and legendary examples, including Alan Adale, Will Scarlet, Amergen and even Homer. So, uh, you know, they could be scalds, jonglers, whatever you want, right? But again, none of those are the types of characters that we would think of as being these overly amorous types of individuals. You know, these are, um, again, I would say they're more on the warrior side. Homer, not so much, but um, yeah. Anyway, so they describe the bards here. This is very typical of second edition D&D. &D. Uh, their reasoning art, this art page is from um, S4 Lost Caverns of Sochkanth module, but they put it here. I don't know why this is on the Bard page, <laughs> to be honest, but uh, it's a great piece of art. I, I love I love Jeff Easley's art, but just never understood why that was there. But they go in to talk about the abilities here now. In this particular case, Bards are going to be treated more like rogues where they can kind of start picking where they want to put their points into their different abilities. And um, they've got, you know, pickpockets and read languages and detect noise and climb walls. They have spells. They go back to magic spells in this version. They're no longer druid spells. Okay. And that's, that's essentially it. So um, you go through here and it talks about only humans and half elves can be bards. 
and uh, they learn a little bit of everything. So again, they're these jack of all trades. And this was the this is the class that kind of defines what that means. The bards, jacks of all trades, they're good at a little bit of fighting, a little bit of thieving, a little bit of magic, and um, that's that's really what um, why you would want to play them, right? They're not going to excel in any one particular thing, but they're going to be good at a bunch of different things. They've changed the ability requirements here. They're still high, but not as high as first edition. But that Charisma 15, again, this is one of the only classes other than Paladin that had a high Charisma um, requirement. I think maybe Druids did as well, if I remember off the top of my head. But in any case, um, that's this is going to be the Druid uh, for second edition. Okay, so that, uh, again, second edition, but in second edition, we also have, there's a whole line of these books. They're called the Complete Handbooks. There's one for every class. Uh, they also have some for classes that actually didn't exist at the time in this book. So if you saw my video on the Barbarian class history, uh, I showed the Complete Barbarian's Handbook. They also had like Complete Dwarves, Complete Elves. There was a combined one for Gnomes and Halflings. And uh, there was a Complete Book of Humanoids, which is where you get your Half-Orcs because the Half-Orcs are not in this book. Um, anyway, uh, this is the Complete Bard's Handbook. Now, this is by a person named Blake Mobley. Blake... Uh, wrote uh, you know quite a few things for um, TSR, uh, some articles in Dragon Magazine, at least one, and then also um, worked on some stuff on Ravenloft and wrote some different adventure modules. And so, um, this uh, basically what this book does, what these complete handbooks do, is just give you a bunch of ideas for. It's mostly player facing, but you know DMs could benefit from this as well. But a bunch of different ideas on on playing bards. So. This particular one is kind of interesting because um, there's a I don't I'm not trying to say anything negative about it, but there's kind of a lot of filler. I, I really like this book. I just put that out there. The ideas that are in here are really great, but there's a lot of stuff that's just kind of filler. So um, the introduction is fine, uh, but then it gets in this whole section on all the other complete books in the series. Um which it doesn't, you didn't really need. and then how to use the book. I mean, I don't really think we needed that. And then this first chapter basically covers everything about how to create a bar that's already in this book. You wouldn't buy this book if you didn't already have this. So I don't really think that we needed this repetition here on how to create a bard. So, um, I, I mean, there's some stuff in here that's helpful, but it could have been, um, changed a little bit. So as an example, you're going to see thief skill adjustments here for bards that are not humans or half elves. And that's because there's a section here on playing uh, what at the time, anything that wasn't a human that was a playable race, they call them demi humans. Okay, so that's all in here. And then um, you have your illegal armor <laughs> adjustments. I just love the way that's worded. But if you're wearing armor, that's not um, you know, leather, like, you know, um, approved, you have to take adjustments on your thieving skills. And then you've got different uh, tables here for your methods of generating your ability scores. Then you get into kits. The kits are the core of all these complete books. So what this is, what a kit is, it takes the core class, and then it makes a couple of changes to it. So um, maybe you get an additional ability, but then you take a hindrance, you take something back. And then um, so that's the balance part of it, right? And then it gives you kind of like a different role and a little bit of flavor, right? It's it's a lot of role playing stuff. Now, some of the kits got abused because what they did was they gave you abilities that were, um, you know, bonuses that were very good and very mechanical in nature. And then the hindrance would be like a role playing thing that a lot of people just ignored. And then they'll say like, oh, these kits aren't balanced. And it's like, well, they're not balanced if you don't use the role playing hindrance. Um, but it is kind of hard to balance a role playing uh, you know, thing against a mechanical thing because the mechanical things are easier to do and they're always going to take precedence because you're going to use, they're going to come up into those situations more often. But in any, in any event, um, the kits in here are pretty good. So for some reason, they have a kit for the true bard and then it just says, oh, well, you don't, this is the typical bard right out of the player's handbook. So once again, they're repeating stuff that's in here. And uh, again, I'm not really sure why why that was done. Maybe it, it's really the only, this is the only um, complete book that I can think of where they do that. Like the complete fighter's handbook doesn't repeat how to how to play like a standard fighter. 
it, it doesn't it doesn't have it doesn't have a true fighter kit but this has the true bar but anyway you get to the blade kit so this is sort of a spy you see here this especially is assassin spy and weapon master so here's your blade and there's this funny little story here where they kind of um compare them to uh you know they, like there's a little um you know fictional um you know introduction to the class all right so that's the blade and they got like these different abilities here so they had different weapon proficiencies and and things like that and they their special benefit was a weapons display so basically this is something like this is what they're doing in lieu of like singing a bard song they're doing a weapon display and this is how they're going to kind of like activate their bardic magic and um basically saying like you know it's not really like somebody might recognize that they don't really have a lot of like physical strength is like a fighter, but they can be mesmerized by their weapon display. Okay. And handling weapons and things like that. And then, so just, I'm just going to, I'm not going to do this for every one of these, but I'm just going to give you an example. Like you see, there's quite a bit of stuff here that they get. All right. And then you have to get into the hindrances. So they don't gain the 10th level ability to use all forms of written magical items. They study weapons, not scrolls, maps, and books. Eh, that's probably not a big enough hindrance for all the different things that these guys get to do, but it just gives you an example of how these work. So then you have the charlatan, which is a trickster or con artist. So you would normally associate that with like a thief or rogue, but here they put it in with the, um, with the bard class. You've got some art here. And reminder, a lot of this art was just reused during this era. Then you've got your gallant, who is the romantic warrior or like the cavalier. So this will just give you, here's an example so that's the gallant, okay? And then uh, they had a code of conduct that they had to uh, adhere to, things like that, okay? So then you have your gallant. So um, you've got to remember the time, folks, of when this is written. So you have your gypsy bard, which is a dancer instrumental, uh, it's their specialist dance instruments and singing, okay? which to me, the way that's described sounds like a standard bard, but... Um, that's that kit. And then you have the Herald, which is a linguist or order. Okay. And then you have the Jester. Okay. So this is kind of like, this is where you're going to kind of get, call on that one that was written in Dragon Magazine by Roger Moore. But also, again, Gary mentioned that he was going to have a Jester subclass. I don't know if that's where this idea um, started with, if like this person was inspired by that article. Um, but in any event, there's your Jester. Then you have the jongleur, which is a juggler or ac acrobat. Okay, and then you've got the lore master. So that's going to come back in third edition. There was a prestige class called the lore master, but this is a chronicler or historian, okay, which I think is a very cool role for a bard to play. So there's your lore masters fascinated by this magical writing while all his comrades are um, being attacked by, it looks like, trolls there. All right, and then you have the Meister Singer, which is the Pied Piper Animal Charmer. So we talked about that a little bit earlier. I think that's, again, another perfect example of a, a role for a bard that kind of, you know, maybe gets you out of the rut of just always playing like the, the overly amorous or lascivious bard. And then you've got your Riddle Master, which in case you didn't know, is a Riddler uh, or an inter intellect. Okay, and then you have your Scald, which is your Viking poet or warrior. Another great idea. And then you've got your thespian, which is an actor or mime. And uh, then you've got a, a, an idea on here on how to create new kits. And they give you all these lists of things. You could be a historical bard, a dervish, a muse, a scop, an entrancer, a troubadour, poet, rustic, rhymist, savage, sleuth, or legionnaire. So um, I really like this idea because what I started thinking of is like, how would each different race or species approach bards? And then I... Uh, I applied that to just different cultures in my campaign world and talked about, um, you know, the different forms of entertainment and music and things like that. And, um, you know, how you could use different forms of entertainment other than just singing and playing stringed instruments like, you know, a mandolin or, or lute or whatever. You can do different things and still be considered a bard, but not that traditional kind of like, you know, foppish singing bard like the guy from the D&D movie, right? You could play it very differently. All right, so then here's your thing on demi-human bards. And it says like, well, they can't really be bards because the player's handbook says that they can't be. However, if you pick one of these kits, you basically can play like a bard, but you're limited to only playing these kits. So dwarves can be dwarven enchanters, 
Um, elves can be minstrels and gnomes can be professors and halflings can be whistlers. So those are new kits that are created that are only available for those demi-humans. And then it says, or, you know, if the DM allows, th- th- like a dwarf could also be a herald or a skald if you allow that, right? So, um, but then that's, that's, this is the area on that. So you've got your dwarven enchanters, which are like time lords. You've got your elven minstrels, which are um, elven spell singers. Then you've got your gnome professors, which are like lecturers. And then you have your halfling whistlers, which are like wanderers. So again, I thought those were some kind of cool ideas. All right. And then you get into, you know, multi-class bards and then your bard abilities. And it goes all through, um, you know, the thief builds. And then it adds a bunch of new ones that you can pick from. And you've got your magic and your spell books and like what can be in them, different spells. And then um, music and then all these different musical instruments that you could pick from, which I think is kind of fun. I love these illustrations here because a lot of these things I just didn't know what they were. So you've got, you know, pages, a couple pages here of those musical instruments and then a glossary to define what they were. And then it gets into um, the fundamentals of music, gives you types of songs that you might want to uh, have access to, like, you know, defining what they mean. And then uh, it gives you some sample songs, which I, again... It's great stuff for, you know, just inspiring your imagination. It gives you advice on how to role play a bard. This is all pretty standard stuff that was in most of the um, complete books. And you've got your bard traits here if you want to just roll randomly to kind of get an idea of what they might be like. Love this, you know, random tables. I'm a big fan of that. If you watch the channel, you know that already. All right. And then it gets into like, you know, different comrades that might be around with a bard class. And then in the appendix, they repeat the first edition bard from the first edition player's handbook. They actually just put that in here for... I guess for posterity's sake, in case you were interested and just curious what the original bard was like. And then there's your bard character record sheet here in the back of the book. So several pages long. (laughs) And uh, that's it. So that's the second edition complete bard's handbook. Now, a lot of the ideas from this also... Um, you know, some of the ideas from second edition, but it, it most there was a lot of things from this that ends up influencing third edition bards. So at this point now, Wizards of the Coast has purchased TSR and they are now publishing Dungeons and Dragons. So this is third edition in 2000. And the bard class in here uh, is a um, standard class. It is no longer like a subclass. There's, you know, they've gotten rid of all that idea, like the subclasses and all that kind of stuff. It's just every class is just, you know, basically published in here, um, you know, uh, alphabetically. So you've got barbarians and you've got bards. So let's look at our bards here and what do they get? They get bardic music. They do get their knowledge. So again, that's that lore skill or ability has now changed names to bardic knowledge. And again, a core ability of the of the bard, the bardic music, that's going to be your charm stuff. So that's how they define it here in third edition is that, you know, they can sing songs to like have different types of effects. So they can inspire courage with that. They can counter song. They can fascinate. That's your charm. OK, and then it, it, it just kind of goes on and on with that kind of thing. But this is sort of this is a big revision. You're getting away. Like, I mean, look at this guy. He doesn't look anything like a Norse scald or, or, or anything like that. Like you're getting far away, not far, but you, you're taking steps to get away from the original concept of the bard. So when it describes him in here, um, it, it doesn't do any kind of historical analogs. Third edition goes away from that. Like second edition was all about pointing you to historical things or other novels, fiction um, and mythology to give you ideas on how to play these characters. Third edition doesn't do that because third edition, um, your mythology is the D&D world. So it's all going to be about how to play within the D&D framework. And it's not going to reference real world stuff anymore. So they get into explaining the bard. And then, okay, so this, we already saw him. This is Divas. That's how I pronounce it. It could be Devas, but I think it's Divas. This is um, the half-elf iconic bard for third edition. So third edition was very big on the idea of every class being represented by a different um, character. So this is Krusk, the iconic half-orc barbarian. So every class has one of those. And Divas was the half-elf um, iconic um Bard, there's Joven the human cleric. Okay, so that's third edition. Now, when 3.5 comes out, there's some few changes to the bard. Um, every class basically gets stronger, so they're they're much stronger uh, than their third edition compatriots. This uh, again, we have Krusk as our um, 3.5 iconic um, barbarian, but then the bard is now represented by Gimbal, 
who is a gnome. So he now is the iconic bard for 3.5, not Divas the Half-Elf, but Gimbal the Gnome. And that's because in this edition of the game, in the 3.5 edition, they've changed the um, favored class of gnomes to um, to become um, bards. Instead of in third edition, I believe it was the, the illusionist sort of like... Um, you know, f focused class, especially wizard class of illusion. And in here, it becomes bard. So that's the bard class in here. You see, they still get their bardic music. They get their bardic knowledge. And it tells you now they've, they're they writing out, like, what does that mean? Counter song, fascinate, inspire courage. They can inspire competence. They, now they get suggestion, greater inspire greatness, song of freedom, mass suggestion, you know, just more stuff, right? Um. They cast spells in 3rd and in 3.5. They cast arcane magic spells, so the same thing as wizards and sorcerers. However, they cast spontaneously like a sorcerer. So uh, in case you're not familiar with the, what that means, um, wizards have to prepare their spells by studying a spell book, and they every morning wake up and pick which spells they want to prepare for that day, and then they cast them, and they get... Um, a wider variety of spells, sorcerers, and then bards cast spontaneously, which means they have a list of spells that they just already know, and um, they can cast them as many times they want and per day, you know, according to this chart. But they don't have to like say specifically which spell that they're going to cast that day. They just have it ready to go. So, um, and then once they're out, they're out. Okay, so that's the three point five bard. Now, in fourth edition, bards are not part of the core. Uh, edition of, of the player's handbook. So they don't debut until the player's handbook two. Now it comes out like a year later. I think the player's handbook one came out in 2008 for fourth edition and the player's handbook two comes out in 2009. So why did they do that? Well, there's no real consensus. Part of it is because I think one of the theories is that um, they, uh, Wizards of the Coast decided in fourth edition to kind of group classes into four different compartments it's very video game-like, but you have controllers, defenders, leaders, and strikers. And in the fourth edition player's handbook, they have two um, leader types, which are clerics and warlords. So it's an interesting choice because warlord was a new class. It had kind of debuted in the 3.5 era. Um, it's kind of like the, there was a martial class in the complete miniatures handbook. It wasn't complete miniatures handbook, but whatever. It was like a miniatures handbook that they had. And they, there was a class in there called the martial. And the warlord is kind of like that. It's a fighter type that is directing people on on um, in combat. Okay. And like where to move and, and, and stuff and giving them abilities. And that's kind of a lot of things that the bard did. So they took the bard out and replaced it with the warlord. So why did they do that? Well, because there were only... I think eight classes in the original player's handbook for fourth edition. And the reason for that is because of space limitations, because every class is like 30 pages long because it ha they each have their own unique powers. And so in order to save space, they had to condense the class list. And so barbarians, druids, bards, three classes right off the top that I can think of, I think sorcerers also are not in the original player's handbook, they're in the player's handbook too. So the other thought is that one of the reasons that they kept those classes out of the first, uh, like the player's handbook one, is because they wanted people to buy the player's handbook too, and they knew people wanted those classes, and the way to get them to buy it was to um, to make sure that they were putting classes in there that would um, you know, make them excited to want to buy that book. Okay, so here you see the bard from, uh, you know, the player's handbook too. It uses the arcane power source. It is a leader type. And um, then you just see like powers and powers and powers here. Um, they've got like, you know, some different paths as they go up in level. Um, none of them really are kind of like, again, they're not really calling back to those, that historical era of the bard. It's kind of like a different vibe to it. But um, that's uh, that's the bard from... Um, second, fourth edition, sorry. And then lastly, just quickly touching on fifth edition. Um, if you're a 5e player, you know this, but the bard is now back. It is a core class in um, in fifth edition. So no longer, you know, in the, you know, player's handbook two or whatever. <laughs> um, and in this particular one, uh, again, you're talking about this intersection of music and magic. There's really not nothing, you know, particularly different here, but you've got your spell casting, you've got bardic inspiration. So um, they're casting their own spell levels, but it, it is arcane magic. And they've got, you know, their expertise, bardic college, um, 
Bardic, again, we talked about Inspiration, Counter Charm. So a lot of these things you've seen before, they're just kind of coming out at different types of levels, okay? So um, very similar, though, to kind of like in, a, in concept to the third edition Bard. All right, so then you've got these Bard Colleges. Now, one of the things that I like is that there's this College of Valor here, and it talks about them kind of being like scalds. And I, I like that idea because it's getting back to that sort of origins of the class of using a scald as one of the archetypes for what the Bard class really means. So that is fifth edition. So um, again, talking about this idea, and I, I've seen it really become prevalent um, you know, in social media over the past, I'd say five years or so, um, this idea again, that the bard has to be this like overly amorous or lascivious character. And, um, there's a few reasons why that might be the case. So again, we talked about the rock kind of icon rock band type of thing. I, I, maybe there's something to that. Um, and that goes all the way far back as like, um, if you've ever heard of Frank List, the composer, um, there was this phenomenon known as listomania, where his fans of his music would kind of like swoon over everything that he was doing. So it's not limited to rock icons. It's sort of like whatever the popular entertainment is at the time. People are going to flock to, you know, the charismatic individuals that embody that type of entertainment, right? So whether it's classical music or jazz or rock, or maybe it could be, um, you know, street artists and painters or actors and things like that right so I, I get that to a point there's there's some there's something to that um there was um you know a, a web comic in the 2000 like early 2000s this is kind of going back to the third edition era and third edition is where i really started to see this right so there's order of the stick there's a bard character in there who's kind of like the goofy um uh, type character and and there's there's some elements to that where he is playing to type of of the stereotype of what people think nowadays what people think of bard is there's also another web co comic by an, an artist named frederick anderson and his are even more lewd and he there's a bard character in there that does those types of acts and and it be kind of kind of became funny but because the community was so much smaller then a lot of people that were playing actually did see that. And I think that they kind of adopted that and continued on with it, right? So now as you have new people coming into the game, I think there's this perception that when people are explaining the bard class to them, they're not explaining it as this kind of like, you know, proud warrior poet, right? They're explaining this like, you know, I hate to use this word, but it's the one I, I see all the time. It's like, oh, they're horny. All bards are horny. And okay, that kind of bothers me. So I'm going to read a little poem here. This is by Thomas Moore uh, from 1813. And hopefully this will give you an idea of like how I think a bard could be played. So I'm not going to sing because my singing voice is terrible, but this is put to music. But the minstrel boy to the war is gone in the ranks of death. You'll find him. His father's sword he hath geared it on and his wild harp slung behind him. Land of songs, said the warrior bard, though all the world betrays thee. One sword, at least thy rights shall guard. One faithful harp shall praise thee. So that's written by the Irish um, artist, uh, writer, and poet um, Thomas Moore, and uh, it's about you know the war for Irish independence. But if you're familiar with Star Trek: The Next Generation, that's the song that Chief O'Brien sings with Captain Maxwell in the episode um, where, um, like, it's about the Cardassian War, right? And then after that, it was used several times in scenes with O'Brien and in a few other scenes as well. Uh, where they just play the music, they don't necessarily sing the song, but if you know that tune, you pick up on it right away. So that that's like this, he's strapping on his sword and he's bringing his harp along and he's going specifically to like sing the praises of the people that he's fighting with. That's a bar, not someone that's just looking to go out and um, have a romantic relationship with everybody that he comes across. That's just so overdone at this point. I just don't even think it's funny. I, I never thought it was funny in the, in the first place, but I think it kind of, to me, if you want to play it like great, it, uh, always, if you're having fun playing the character or playing the game a certain way, then just you and your group all enjoys that, then keep doing that. All I'm saying is that's not something I enjoy. And I think it's fun to kind of stretch and look for different ways to play these characters that everyone else seems to think fit within a certain stereotype. All right. So that's kind of my look at the history of the Bard class. 
uh, through the game and kind of how it's changed over editions. Uh, but I do want to tell a quick story here about a bard uh, character that I um, interacted with. So this was played by one of my friends and um, it was for a third edition game. And we were, it, it was sort of like a, it was, it was a tight, it wasn't a one shot, but it was very much kind of like, we're only going to play for a few sessions and we kind of had some goofy characters. And so he, uh, created a character called Cronog, which was a barbarian. So in third edition, there is a feat called leadership. And the leadership feat, uh, I can't find it here off the top of my head, but the leadership feat gives you uh, what's called a cohort. Okay, so um, it's described, oh, and the Dungeon Master's Guide, that's why I can't find it here. Okay, so, but it gives you a, a cohort. So it's essentially a second character that you play that's like a few levels below you, but it moves up in level as you move up in level. So he created this barbarian character called Kronog and then took the leadership feat and he had a bard cohort. And the thing about Kronog was the way this character, this way this player played him was that um, Kronog spoke a language called Kronog, which meant that everything he said was Kronog. That was the only word he used. So you'd say, Kronog, what do you think we should do? And he'd say, and the player would answer. He'd say, Kronog. And then you'd say like, Oh, Kronog, like, watch out behind you. And he'd go, Kronog. And then, um, you know, you'd, or you'd say like, oh, I think we should, you know, we should stop and rest um, for the night or whatever to recover hit points, whatever we're doing. And he'd say, you know, he'd kind of nod his head and go, mm, Kronog. And, and it was really funny. But what was even, uh, you know, more funny was that um, then the same player would have the cohort speak for him. So you'd say something to, and, and Kron say, Kronog. And then, the, uh, then he'd say, uh, th then he'd switch voices and have this bard character speak for Kronog and say, Kronog says that, yes, we should rest and he'll take the first watch. Or Kronog says that you should flank the guy or sneak behind or like whatever. And then he'll he'll distract them from the front or like whatever. And so it was always like this one word. It, it, it's always only in one word. It's never like Kronog, Kronog. It's just Kronog. And then he would say, Kronog says this. Kronog says that. Kronog says And so... You can imagine if you played this in a long term campaign, it would get really annoying. But this again, this was this was limited to like a certain just, you know, a few, maybe four or five sessions. And um, it was hilarious because we would try to think like, what's he actually saying? And he would change his tone of voice, kind of like, you know, I am Groot from from Guardians. But this is way before Guardians of the Galaxy came out. We'd never seen anything like this. And we just thought it was hilarious. And this bard would then interpret for him. OK, so then just to kind of and I, so. I think that's a fun way to use a bard. It's almost kind of like the Herald class from here. Not quite, but the, the idea that you have somebody that is kind of singing your praises. This bard would write songs about um, Kronog and his exploits, and they were overly exaggerated. You know, Kronog defeated the setting sun or like whatever. It was hilarious. And he would and he would write these songs and sing these songs. The player didn't sing the songs, but the bard would. Um, and then he would interpret everything Kronog was saying. Okay, so flash forward. Um, this is not a bard story, but it's related to the Kronog story. I just think it's hilarious. And um, hopefully you guys will enjoy this. So I'm at a convention with these friends and um, there was a Dungeon Crawl Classics game being played. If you're familiar with Dungeon Crawl Classics, it's a, called a character funnel. You start with a bunch of zero level characters and then whoever survives past the first session gets to become first level. So my friends had gone the night before they flew into town. They went to the convention and they played in this DCC game and he played a zero level character that he decided was going to be Kronok and Kronok ends up surviving to become first level. So the next day I show up, I have to play a zero level character. He's got his first level Kronok that survives. So Kronok is now, you know, powerful <laughs> comparing first level to zero level. Right. And so, but he was doing this bit where he would just answer like Kronok, but we are at a convention. There's a lot of players. So a lot of people hadn't really picked up that that's what he was doing. And he also didn't have an interpreter. OK, and so I had played with him before and I knew that he usually had this interpreter. But in this particular case, we're zero level characters. There's no way that he would have someone following him around. So he just didn't do that. So he was just kind of mostly going through the motions of like fighting. But and he wasn't talking a lot. So, again, people weren't picking up that all he ever said was Kronok. So I get into the game. My guy sucks. He was like a zero level beekeeper. And, you know, I just wanted to survive. And my highest ability score that I had, you know, I was given this character was charisma. And I decided that I was going to play to that. And so um, something happened in the game and um, my friend was playing Kronog and somebody asked him a question and he said, Kronog. And I jumped in before anybody could do anything. And I said, 
I actually am from Cronog's village and we grew up together and he's looking at me like, what are you doing? And I was like, and Cronog said that, you know, he knows I have some special honey here. That's like healing honey. Cause remember I was a beekeeper. And um, so you want to keep me safe because um, I'm the only one that can kind of help people out if anyone gets in trouble, right? I've, I've got some some honey here that's a very special. And, um, you know, it works on most people. It doesn't always work, but it's probably our best shot, right? So I'm just talking, just, you know, I'm riffing, right? And he's looking at me and he starts shaking his head negative, like, like, chronic. And I said, oh, yeah, no, Chronix is definitely like this is the and everyone's looking at us like what is happening right now? And they weren't picking up on this. And my friend and I are trying to like role play and we were really trying to keep from laughing. And so I just kept going through interpreting for him, saying that he was basically saying, you know, everyone protect me, keep me alive till the end of the adventure because I wanted to become a first level character. And um and I knew that's not obviously I knew that's not what he was saying. And um, but, you know, he couldn't say anything because he had written this character where he wouldn't. And so he wasn't going to come out of character and say, that's not what he said. He just rolled with it. And so he was trying through like facial expressions and body language to indicate that that's not what he was saying. But because nobody else knew what he was trying to say, um, I just, you know, I just went with it. And my guy ended up I did survive and I became first level and I decided to become a cleric. Uh, because I had told everybody that I had these healing powers and I thought I might as well, you know, use that to my advantage. So um, just a funny story uh, again, but, you know, going back to this idea of like having a bard kind of be the person that speaks for your character or, or, um, you know, kind of like, you know, sings their praises and stuff, I think can be kind of a cool way to look at it. Okay. So again, that's uh, my look at the history of the bard class. I really hope that you enjoyed this video and that you're liking these videos on the history of the different classes. So uh, please let me know, like if you could go into the comments and let me know um, how you like this format. If there's uh, parts that I didn't cover, I know there's, you know, other articles in Dragon Magazine about bards, things like that. So, um, you know, I can always come back and cover that in a future issue. This is just kind of like a top level view, but love to hear your thoughts on that. If you could also please like the video and subscribe to my channel, I'd really appreciate it. While you're in your comments below, you can also find links where you can join me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Blue Sky. You can visit my blog to find content that I've created there. And you can visit my shop where um, you'll find uh, places where you can buy t-shirts, mug mugs, hoodies, and posters, things like that with the designs you can't find anywhere else. So with that, I'd like to say thank you again very much for watching. Stay safe, happy gaming, and I'll talk to you next time. Now for the bonus content of this video, what I was drinking and what I was listening to while I made my notes for this uh, video. So drinking wise, I was having some of this. This is High West Double Rye, which is a blend of straight rye whiskeys. So um, I, I uh, just, I mean, you see there's just a tiny little bit there. So I'm going to share what's left of this bottle with, with you all folks here um, virtually uh, as a way to say thanks again for, for all of your support of my channel. But uh, so I really like rye whiskey. It might be controversial, but I think I like it better than bourbon. It depends on my mood for sure. Depends on my mood. Also what I'm eating, like what I'm pairing it with. But um, I like the spiciness of rye. So this is a blend of different rye whiskeys, again, from High West Distillery, which is out of Utah. So Park City. Uh, Utah. Um, when I was a kid, I used to play soccer in Park City um, on a, there was a, it was at the time they called it deer hunting weekend. It was like the first weekend in October, or the middle, I, I don't know, it was some weekend in October and you got the whole, you got an extra day off. It was a three day weekend and um, I'm not a hunter. And so um, they used to have a big soccer tournament. And so we would travel from where I lived up to Park City and like where, what they did was mix people from different cities onto like different teams. And like for a weekend, you played with a mixture of different people, which is really fun. Anyway, that's what I think of when I think of Park City. Um, I also have a friend, uh, it, uh, tabletop role playing game friend on Twitter who is from Utah. He's not from Park City, but um, thought of him when I poured this, poured this out. So um, it's a blend of different ones. So it's got um, both pot still and calm still whiskeys. So um, I think that's why they called it double rye. It's also a higher. Um, so you can see that's 46% um, alcohol by volume. So that's 92 proof. A typical bottle of bourbon is going to be 80. So again, this is a little strong, but uh, that's why I just have, you know, just a little bit here. Hmm. Oh yeah, that's nice. Okay, and then just one of my favorite albums of all time, What's Going On, Marvin Gaye, 1971. Classic soul record. Um, I mean, the lead track alone is like worth the price of admission, but then it just keeps getting better. There's so much on here. 
You've got songs about the ecology. You've got songs like Inner City Blues, Make Me Want to Holler. Love that song. Um, so just kind of like talking about the experience of living in America at that time, living in the world and like what's what's going on? We're polluting the skies and we're doing things and, you know, people are dying in wars and um, I can't pay my taxes and you know, like that kind of thing, like stuff that we still deal with today. Right. So um, but just all with this gorgeous orchestration and his voice, his songwriting, Billy, just definitely check this album out if you've never heard it before. I just I doesn't work to explain it. You just got to listen to it. Just, you know, make sure that you're paying attention when you listen. Don't put it on while you're cleaning the house or, you know, doing something else. Like just give it a, a real listen. And I hope that you enjoy it like I do. So um, again, I'd like to say to all of you, thank you so much for your continued support of my channel. Uh, if, me, if you made it this far, thanks for watching this bonus content. I really get a kick out of putting it together and um, kind of just giving you another side of who I am as an individual. So I'm not just a bunch of, you know, hands showing a bunch of old books uh, that, you know, I'm more than that. And uh, so thanks again. Uh, cheers and happy gaming.